All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, my name is Kelly Carla, and I am the founder and executive director of Acton on Verba Youth Urban Farm Project. It's my pleasure to be here with you all. And um, yeah, <laughs> um, I think I'm not sure if I'm supposed to share. Nope, somebody else is sharing that thing. Excellent. Um, and so our, uh, we would love to start out with a land acknowledgement. Um, Actinon Verba Youth Urban Farm Project acknowledges that we live and work in the stolen Chochinho and Muekma territories of the Ohlone people. We are committed as an organization to advancing and supporting the return of these lands to its original stewards and to honoring and amplifying the Ohlone people's continued presence on these occupied lands to all who interact with Actinon Verba. You can learn more about the Ohlone tribe and the lands that you live or work on at the link in the chat box. I will uh, also put it there again uh, for the folks that came in a little bit late. There you go. Um, I would like to introduce uh, the panelists now. Um, here we go. Uh, I'll end with myself. Um, I'll start with Dr. Paul Roger, who is an agroecologist who coordinates the Urban Agroecology Certificate at Merritt College. Dr. Roger co-founded Agroecology Commons and the Cooperative New School, two organizations dedicated to food and environmental justice. Kanshan Don Hunter is the co-director of Spiral Gardens Community Food Security Project, a nonprofit organization in Berkeley dedicated to making, transforming, and growing organic farming, promoting environmental justice, and ensuring food security. As co-director co and as a woman of color, Kanshan strives to serve her community's needs to the best of her ability. Kanshan's mission is to generate an understanding among all people with whom she interacts that it is possible to have a loving and living relationship with our Mother Earth. Annika Levet. Lavag, Lavag, I'm so sorry, Annika. <laughs> Lavaggi, I want to say Lavaggi. Uh, please correct me um, if that's in, if that's wrong. Lavaggi, but it's a tricky one. Lavaggi, thank you. Is a fourth year undergraduate student at UC Berkeley studying socio agroecology and developing a community informed model for urban agriculture education for their thesis. Annika has been involved with the campus farming community since coming to Cal and has worked as the garden manager at various sites, a researcher in the Bowles Lab, and most recently facilitating the Berkeley Student Farms Coalition and its class. Moe Sumino is a second year undergraduate student at UC Berkeley from Japan, studying rural agro agricultural development and researching soil health indicators with the Bowles Ag Agroecology Lab. She is a garden manager at the Student Organic Garden, SOGA, and works with Annika on facilitating the Berkeley Student Farms Coalition and its class. Dr. Katie Krolikowski, Krolikowski is a professor at Contra Costa Community College where she has spearheaded the Soil micro, Microbiome Project, which gives student research analysis and job experience in biotechnology. Katie loves working with her students and takes special care to make sure they see themselves as potential scientists. Science will be changed for the better, she believes, when people from underserved communities make up a substantial portion of the scientific community. All right, so uh, I would love to invite the panelists to uh, introduce themselves again. That way they can, uh, our audience can put a name with the faces that I've uh, butchered the names of. Um, and please let us know your pronouns, your organization, academic program. And the big, the big thing I think, especially for the audience is to tell us your why. Why are you doing the work that you're doing, studying what you're studying in the communities that you're in? Um, yeah, I will uh, start with 
Dr. Katie, whose name, you know, I, because I've jacked up your last name, please go first, Dr. Katie. Actually, you did perfectly. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> Kralikowski. <laughs> Yeah. Hello, everybody. I didn't want to go first because um, agroecology is not exactly what I do. So I wanted to hear what everybody else said first, but I will do my best. <laughs> um, so uh, I go by she and her pronouns. And um, I'm here um, as the lead faculty for the biotech program at our community college just up here in the East Bay, Contra Costa College. And, you know, my job is to prepare students to work in the biotech industry. That, that's where my paycheck comes from. And when we think of the biotech industry, you know, we think of Genentech and Bayer and Gilead. And now we've been thinking about the companies that make COVID vaccines like Pfizer and everything. And, um, you know, people don't think always in terms of ecology and those aspects of biology when they think about biotechnology. Um, but, you know, technology based on physical sciences is used all the time in ecology and environmental monitoring. Think of your pH meters, the minerals in your soil, all the technology we use to study our environment, um, how much CO2 levels are in the air, and even this meeting we're having today, right? This is all based on technology that, that's physical sciences. And so biotechnology is just doing kind of the same thing, but it's using what we know about biology to study our world. And um, we, it's just that we use biological molecules rather than the inert substances of, of the world. And so in my job, back to my job, uh, I'm, you know, it's good to have project based real world based educational experiences. And, you know, most of us realize that we learn so much more when we're engaged in a real project with real meaning um, for somebody else in the world. Right. Just doing going to school to get a grade is not that inspiring. And so um, for biotech, what kind of projects can we do? Right. We can't invent cancer drugs in the community college space. We can't even do covid testing because it's an FDA regulated type um, thing. And so when I heard about Urban Tilth, which is a community farm, and I'll show you that in just a second, um, all of a sudden I was like, wow, here is a project where students can apply the tools of biotechnology to do something meaningful in the community and learn what they need to learn for any type of job in the biotech industry. And so um, it's been so exciting to um, put together this project. We started it in 2016. And I'll just show you briefly so you can see where I sit in this space. And I've got some quick pictures because pictures are worth a thousand words. Um, we call it the Soil Microbiome Project. And it's absolutely a collaboration between you know, my program at the community college, um, Urban Tilth, which is our important community partner, and also an industry partner called iCultivar, run by doc Dr. Rajneesh Khanna. And so Urban Tilth, lots of you may have heard of them. Um, they're an organization that's been around for over a decade in North Richmond area, and they take over spaces that are underutilized and grow food, right? They, they build resilience, food for the community, uh, by the community, um, and really want to empower everybody to know where their food is from. And so um, they also have a big educational mission. They run a community garden at Richmond High School, which is right down the street from my, my college. And, and they've just been working for a long, long time um, at, at this mission. And they take over lots of sites, and they've always been kind of scientific about it. Um, they took over an unused middle school called Adams Crest many years ago. And the first time I visited there, here's what I saw, right? The, the rows and they'd been developing the soil there and doing science. There were like 18 of these little setups when I was there and they're comparing when we did this to one row, what did the soil turn out like? When we did this to the other row, what did the soil turn out like? So this was a natural partner for, for me trying to help students be scientific. We're just using different tools. And so our study site, is this thing called the North Richmond Farm, which is a three acre um, county land space, which was really kind of blank packed clay in 2016. Um, turned out it doesn't have any you know, toxins or things like that in the soil, but it, it just had junk on it. And so over uh, many years, Urban Tilth cleared it out and started um, developing the soil starting in spring of 2017 when they started their, their orchard at a community event during Martin Luther King Day. And then a year later, here were students from Contra Costa College starting to take soil samples. 
And so we sample the soil over time to try to help urban till tell the story of what is going on inside the soil as they make a productive food environment um, in the community. And here's another um, picture of sampling, right? There are different areas of the farm where urban tilth is doing different things. And so we're making comparisons about what happens at the microbe level um, as urban tilth makes a very productive farm. And I'll just finish up by pointing out that we get that soil and then it just looks like any old biotech lab. Students are in there, they're working, here they're extracting DNA. Here we're treating the soil like gold because <laughs> it really is, it's an important sample of a time and space um, of this farm developing. And um, I just so excited to see um, our students really being scientists. And um, that's really what motivates me um, in this work is that we can do a real project, provide real scientific information to a community customer. And I think we add something really different to this idea of agroecology by bringing in these, these technical tools. And so I know I've gone a little longer than was planned for me. So I will be quiet and let us move on to the next person. Thank you so much. Um, let's move on to Moe. Uh, Moe and uh, Annika are going to be working together. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Kelly. Hi, everyone. My name is Moe. I use the she, her pronouns. Hi, everyone. My name is Annika. I use the she, they pronouns. Um, and Moe and I are both undergraduates here at UC Berkeley. Um, and when I first came to the school four years ago, um, was actually on Prospective Student Day and I was sold on the school by the Assistant Dean of Students um, and her promise of offering a different type of academia, one that really gave students land-based experiences and tackling the many crisis, crises that our food system faces. Um, as the story goes, I sort of spent a lot of time in these like giant windowless lectures sort of wondering about that, that land-based experience and what happened to it. Um, and when I finally found it, I was very much so standing on the fringes of the institution as a part of a Gidea gardening movement on campus. And so this type of farming generation that really raised me um, functioned much like the mycelium that they were cultivating. Um, the group was working to create basically different networks of food forests around campus, taking over um, lawn space, making them into farms, um, and really showing the potential for local solutions to meet our community's basic needs of which about 40% of our population, our student population on campus identifies as experiencing food insecurity. And so along with it, they were also working on this sort of political movement of borrowing a lot of inspiration from landless peasant movements in the global South, as well as sort of movements that came before us right here in the Bay Area from folks like the Black Panthers to really organize and educate on these ideas of food sovereignty and of agroecology as mechanisms of resistance. And so we were really asking this question of, you know, what does it mean to reclaim resources and knowledge um, to share amongst each other about how do we grow our own food and how do we control our access to culturally relevant crops right here in Huchin or in downtown Berkeley. But sort of to the university, growing hopai, blue corn or black beans in downtown Berkeley really like misses out on this larger capital strategy um, of real estate development. And so today we find ourselves still in this ongoing struggle with the administration um, who's put forth proposals to develop market rate student housing on the largest of the student farms. And sort of we see the need to support our community's basic needs, both housing and food security as very entangled and sharing the same roots of oppression. And so in many ways, this coalition that we've both helped to start and are very involved with that we call Berkeley Student Farms um, has grown out of this precarious situation of, of potential development sort of as a way to mobilize um, students and scaffold long-term resilience of these spaces. Um, but similarly, it's also grown out of a need to address entangled issues of occupying unceded Ohlone land, of extreme food insecurity amongst our community, and of students yearning for a place-based hands-on education um, that is hard to come by in our metropolitan environment. And so in this way, our coalition really looks to pool resources, to redistribute um, them, and to co-create and share knowledge to strategize collaborative and multidisciplinary solutions to help heal both ourselves and the land. 
And while student turnover is of course constant in our community, we are really trying to and nesting ourselves within the various organizations and departments on campus in order to scaffold, like Anna, Annika just said, this long-term resilience and force the university to kind of see the demands, the needs and the irreplaceable benefits that these gardens and farms are providing. So for example, we work really closely with the Basic Need Center on campus and supply over half of the fresh produce they dis distribute. We also work with the Berkeley Food Institute, the Food Systems Minor, and professors like Timothy Bowles of the Agroecology Lab to cultivate these really important relationships with the administrative and faculty here on campus. And at the heart of most of these gardens is our partnership with campus uh, departments and research centers. And this is especially true for our affinity gardens as half of the BSF Berkeley Student Farms gardens are created by and led by and for BIPOC students. So for example, the Fannie Lou Hamer Black Re Garden is at the heart of the Black Research Center and the same goes for the Native Student Garden, Multicultural Community Gardener Garden and the Hispanic Engineers Rooftop Garden. And lastly, in addition to these cross-campus collaborations, there are many internal projects projects within BSF, such as the creation of a seed library, a community cookbook, and compost sovereignty that have all grown out of the unique passions and dreams of the various folks in our community. And so this semester, Moe and myself and our friend Cole, who I believe is on call, um, worked to sort of expand the educational offerings of the Berkeley Student Farms community. And so in doing this, we facilitate a semester-long course called Agroecology in Action. And so we focus on both the practical skills of agroecology through our hands-on weekly workshop series, and then also kind of the histories and the strategies for land liberation and food sovereignty um, in our weekly discussion meetings. And as we fill these gaps and kind of reimagine the potential of agricultural education at our university, we're also really wrestling with and reconciling with the university's history as a land grant university institution and as a handmaiden to biotech companies like Syngenta and really wanting to instead center decolonization and pedagogies of the oppressed. And so in doing this, we're focused on uplifting BIPOC leadership, really increasing the accessibility of our gardens, compensating people for their labor and really wanting to center the narratives and experiences of the people who have been oppressed by the food system and really honing into a co-learning environment. Um, and so lastly, just wanna add that while our co coalition is somewhat young, we see ourselves as part of this long ancestry of land liberation work here in Huchin, just like our neighbors at People's Park are currently fighting for the right to public green space. And so in this way, we see ourselves as something much bigger than just a student organization, but as a part of the movement manifesting food sovereignty in the Bay. That was fantastic. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm going to move on to the beautiful and brilliant Kanshan Don Hunter with Puppy. Kanshan, uh, okay. there you are. No. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I was in charge of that button. Hi, I'm Kanchan. Uh, good to have everybody on. Um, thank you, uh, all of you who spoke uh, just before me uh, for your magnificent work. Uh, it's an honor to be in your company um, and everyone who's joined here today. Um, grateful to be on the board of directors of Urban Till, Katie. Super happy about that. Doria is one of my best friends and also so grateful to be in close connection with Soga and all of the work going on in the um, Berkeley Food Collective on campus at UC Berkeley. So you guys rock, keep rocking, do that. Thank you. And thank you for always partnering with Spiral Gardens uh, in Berkeley. So um, I'm co-director at Spiral Gardens Community Food Security Project. I do not have any slides. I feel a little short there, <laughs> so forgive me. You just have my voice and my dog's shoulder. Um, yes, thank you for all your work. I'm um, uh, excited to introduce Spiral Gardens to those of you who don't already know about who we are and what we do. We're a nonprofit community food security project in South Berkeley. We're 28 years old. Uh, we are one of the original 
guerrilla projects in Berkeley, uh, realizing um, at our out at our founding that uh, folks of color in communities where you know access to healthy food is um, most definitely kept away. Uh, maybe if we just like go and just plant a bunch of food somewhere, um, people can get that um, food. Okay, dog. Okay, all right. Anyway, you don't need to see me. So, <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> the idea was to make food access much more attainable uh, by creating um, gardens in places where land was being unused and neglected. And in doing so, folks were able to access roughly, you know, food grown locally in uh, community soil that was being um, poorly used. Um, it grew out of uh, that idea. And then going forward, um, Spiral Gardens became a training ground for folks of color who are struggling with addiction, struggling with homelessness, um, and uh, we partnered with an organization early on called um, Building Opportunities for Self-Sufficiency, also known as BOSS. Um, BOSS fiscally sponsored Spiral Gardens in its early days to be a training space for folks that are struggling um, on the outskirts of life as a lot of us know it, and um, basically help them learn how to grow food or just grow plants, how to steward soil, how to um, you know, use tools to that effect, um, just all of the ways that we can train um, folks in horticultural understanding so that then they could not only be self-sufficient with what they've learned, but also so that they could um, go out and maybe make a trade for themselves, teach others, many of those folks went on to build their own businesses in landscape design, um, gardening, horticulture, many different types of ways, and also um, to get their own farms, many of those original apprentices. So, so that's what Spiral Garden started out as. Now, <clears throat> fast forward 17 years later, we are um, currently located on two blocks of land on the Santa Fe right of way in South Berkeley. Um, we have developed a low cost nursery where we sell plants so folks can grow food at their own homes. And we have um, out, of, out of those plant sales, the proceeds go to fund the community farm, which is a free community farm. It's not like your typical community garden model where you pay for a plot and it's your own plot. And you, you know, you privately stock that pot with food and plants. Oh, sit, sit. Um, you, <laughs> we, we steward the farm together as a community. Um, there's no bosses, you know, there's no, nobody telling you what to do or anything like that. And everything we grow at the community farm is shared throughout the community. Um, so whether you're planting tomatoes one day with a couple other people. Everybody gets to harvest from those tomatoes. The greens that we grow year rounds, you know, are harvested, harvested no matter whether you planted them or not. Um, education is built into everything that we do. So whether you're a volunteer at the nursery um, or you're a community member being an urban farmer on the farm, we teach you whatever we know. And we also encourage folks to teach us what they know. So it's, uh, it's, it's really, we're, what we're really trying to do is encourage community members, especially folks of color, to get engaged in local soil and all that it can produce. We have learned a lot over the years how to build soil. We've learned a lot about how to create composting systems. We've learned a lot about how to build community through outreach, communication, and uh, we really uh, encourage folks uh, to understand that everyone has access, not only to local soil, but whatever that soil 
grows and that the community is in charge of the production of that, that food or that medicine. We grow a lot of medicinal herbs together. Uh, we, we make a lot of medicine together. And one of the things that I love doing most is holding community gatherings in a safe way these days. But before <laughs> I was mostly doing big community gatherings where we would have big medicine making round tables. We would set up different um, stations where some people would be making tea blends out of dried herbs. Some people would be working on tinctures. Some people would be collecting seeds from plants that have gone to seed and saving those seeds so that we can plant future um, medicinal stands. Uh, some of us would be working on harvesting, harvesting the plants that we would use in these preparations. And it's a very rich teaching environment um, because I love teaching med medicinal herbs and I love teaching med medicine making. We spend a lot of time talking about why we do this, why it's important to be in charge of you know, the medicines that go into our bodies, why it doesn't always have to be pharmaceutical. Uh, it can actually be plant-based. Um, so we talk about why, we talk about how, a lot about how, and then we do the big hands-on move. And that's true for all of our food process as well, like growing the food from seed to table. We have cooking classes, uh, lovely, amazing chefs that come in and teach us how to prepare amazing food from the food that we've grown in our community garden. And it's just the best. Like we'll have chefs come in and we'll go and look around and see what's growing in the season that it's growing. And then we'll do a community harvest together. And then we'll do a community cooking pro project together. And it's just like, it's so simple, but it's also so revolutionary in my opinion. You know, I feel really strongly that, um, everyone deserves to have the understanding about how to engage closely with the earth, how to engage with the products that she so lovingly offers us. We don't even have to even think about it most of the time. There's so much that we can forage on our own in the wilds. You know, as long as we do so respectfully and the understanding that I like to impart for the most part is like, the earth is our mother, she gives us everything. That doesn't mean we can take everything. One of, one of the ways that I feel like it's important to really understand is that it's a blessing to live on this planet. And if I can just get that one thing into the hearts and minds of folks that I am privileged to come in contact with, then I feel like I've done my life's work. I just like know her listen to her and engage with her, connect with her. There's lots of ways to do that. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there's so much I could say. I feel like I talk about spiral gardens all the time, <laughs> but it's good to be here. I don't want to say much more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kanshan. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Paul Roger. Hey everybody, give me one second here. I'm gonna share some photos, some slides. I'm gonna briefly introduce to you all um, the Certificate of Achievement in Urban Agroecology that I co-coordinate uh, with Yael Ehrenberg at Merritt College in Oakland, California. Uh, we're housed under the Natural History and Sustainability Program, which is, uh, identified by this lichen in the left-hand corner um, to represent the uh, diverse relationships that make life happen on our earth and also uh, the way that we try to approach our education in a welcoming uh, way to ev for everyone and uh, particularly in the fields of environmental sciences and agroecology. And my main reason for doing what I do, especially at Merritt College, is that I truly believe that uh, we need community education for community-based food systems. We need programs in urban agroecology at every community college in the country, in my opinion. 
And um, Merritt College in particular, uh, I think it was Moe or Anika who alluded to the Black Panther Party and their free school, a uh, free breakfast for school children program. Um, Merritt College had a, a role to play in the formation of the Black Panther Party in 1966 and uh, through the African American Studies program. And uh, I truly believe that these sorts of educational experiences change students' perceptions of their realities and empower them to make change in the world. Uh, today, Merritt College serves 85% minority students. And in the horticultural realm, we've got a seven and a half acre uh, center uh, located in a very beautiful part of campus with a 5,000 square foot lath house and teaching facilities. In the next few years, that facility is going to be renovated. Uh, we're very excited about that. Um, but it's a, a wonderful teaching uh, resource for the community. Um, it's one of the best I've seen. I don't even after teaching at UC Berkeley for some time, I don't think there's uh, the equivalent uh, opportunity as there is at Merritt College. Um, our program it has a bunch of uh, community organizers and uh, and business leaders and, and environmental stewards on our, our advisory board. Some of those that are directly involved with uh, urban agroecology include the Alameda County Office of Education, uh, Sustainable Agriculture Education or SAGE, All Power Labs, and Planting Justice. And often our education uh, uh, offer, uh, happens in collaboration with many of these partners. So for example, we have a very robust program with Oakland Unified School Districts at high schools. We offer dual enrollment courses where students earn college credit at the same time as earning uh, high school credit for the classes we offer there. Uh, we have summer leadership programs for high school students, particularly in about a year from now, we're gonna be offering a leadership program for high school students in collaboration with UC Cooperative Extension and their 4-H program. And uh, we also have an exciting collaboration with Agroecology Commons that's about to begin this summer to have farmer-led education uh, where students are learning through a nonprofit uh, with farmers who are actually you know, showing them what they know uh, in the field and students are able to earn college credit if they want it through Merritt College. So I just wanted to highlight the people involved in Agroecology Commons. I, I happen to be one of the seven founding members. Uh, so there's uh, Brooke Porter, Geneva uh, uh, Kilgore, Will Smith, Tana Madaras, uh, Leah Atwood, and uh, Natasha Metzcourt. And this uh, multicultural group is, uh, you know, really working hard to share leadership and the, uh, our goal is to cultivate knowledge sharing, community action, and global solidarity for decolonized land stewardship, collective healing, and justice within the food movement. Um, I wanted to just highlight this chapter from a book that came out in 2021. It's a book called um, Urban Agroecology, Interdisciplinary Research and Future Directions. And a um, group of my co-conspirators and co-educators uh, penned this chapter, uh, it includes Ana Galvis, Brooke Porter, myself, Leah Atwood, and Natalia Pinson Jimenez. And we reflect on holistic pedagogies for social change. And I, we don't have time right now to talk about all of it, but um, we focus on the pedagogies uh, that, are, that we feel are important, important for urban agroecology that include critical pedagogies, thinking about um, uh, the uh, root causes of oppressive systems that lead to inequality in our society, humanizing pedagogies that recognize each person's experience and, uh, and, and brings the human element into the classroom. And finally, this is somewhat related, constructivist pedagogies that uh, build on what people have experienced in their knowledge base uh, and uh, to, to inform what we know. And then in terms of curriculum concepts, what we try to draw in are value-centered uh, uh, frameworks where we look at, at what kind of values we want to uplift in ourselves and how that relates to the topics that we're studying. 
focusing uh, not only on the technical aspects of food production, but also on relations, decolonizing frameworks. So thinking about um, histories of colonialism and uh, oppression and how that relates to our food systems today. Uh, open conversations around gender and sexuality, looking at the imbalance of uh, land ownership by white men, for example. Honoring queer identities in the classroom, being fully aware of the full diversity of our students and recognizing that there are spiritual and mystic connections to agroecology. And we also, I, again, I'm not going <laughs> to go into the too much depth on this, but we have uh, uh, some recommendations in the chapter on how to uh, make urban agroecology uh, political <laughs> and then also how to approach the educational and programmatic um, tactics for implementing it. So thank you very much. And if you'd like to learn more about our programs at Merritt College, the link is here, meritcollege.edu backslash NHS backslash agroecology. Back to you, Kelly. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks for the the detailed download. And I recognize so many people in your photos. I'm like, hey, hey, <laughs> 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 I haven't seen you in a while. How you doing? <laughs> uh, so um, thank you all to all of our panelists for being so wonderful and inspirational. Um, Moe and Annika, I have so many questions for you. Um, I, um, both of my parents went to UC Berkeley, this uh, farm, um, the Berkeley Food Institute and, and so on are all so new to me. I'm like, huh, so when that shit come up? You know, <laughs> it's, it's really inspirational. And uh, Dr. Katie, thank you so much for starting us off. It was really wonderful to, to see the photos of students um, both taking soil from the ground and, and uh, doing the tests on it. We have been trying to send our soil samples to Kentucky for some reason for 10 years and never get anything back. So, you know, we're, we're just hoping that we're good, I guess. Um, <laughs> so this part of the afternoon is the dialogue. Um, Actually, I'm gonna mix it up a little bit and just jump into the questions from the chat box um, because I think those are a little bit more targeted. Um, and Benjamin Ferrer is um, a community member that I'm sure lots of us know. <laughs> uh, and he is asking, what do the educators feel is lacking the most in their efforts? He'd love to hear from each of the educators on their most desired income, uh, outcomes of their programs and efforts. Let's start with Dr. Katie. All right, thank you. It's Benjamin, right, who wrote that question? Yes. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's nice to come back around after hearing um, everyone else on this panel. I have so many reflections. I'll try to <laughs> weave some in. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, no, the challenge and what we wish could happen. You know, I'll start with that. Um, the way our project runs, we're, we're trying to tell the story of what is happening in the soil over a long period of time, right? Urban Tilth wants to be storytellers to the community because it's really sometimes hard to talk about dirt. I think a lot of people here might realize that other people are like, why is dirt so exciting? And so telling that story is, is our goal. And there's and we've been working on it for four years and we have not been able to do so. And so there's this impatience, right? Um, Doria, who is just such a great partner, she's like, can we get some information? <laughs> and I wanna say what the reason is, and it does have to do um, with something that I reflected on as Kanchan was talking. Um, I think a natural way that our work in the lab um, happened probably was due to the culture of, of these kinds of projects. Because you, know, you usually go to school and the teacher says, here's what we're doing, here's the lab protocols, follow along and get your grade. I invented this project that I would kind of share with the students how it goes, but every team has written the protocols themselves that the next team gets in the next semester. That when I was looking at those pictures, I'm remembering the group from 2017 and how they structured the project 
and it was at the pace of what students care about. And I helped remind them of the values. And that makes me think of what Paul was talking about. We weren't so formal about being values driven, but the way our work goes is we look out for each other in the lab. We play to each other's skills and different people do different things in a graded class and still all get their A's. And it, we do work together in terms of how we can work as a, as a collective and it's funny because it, that's what's so different about this way of education, but it does seem to draw off of this culture that we're talking about here. And so that an issue is that the work is slow because we have new people coming in all the time, kind of picking up the project. And I think it was Moe that was telling about this. It could have been Annika. I, I was not looking um, how to keep the project going over time in the system when new students are coming in and out. That's a big challenge is figuring out how to communicate between different cohorts or groups, whatever you want to call um, over time and finding I end up kind of being that glue, but I, I wish I had a, a better way to do that. And the second piece is communicating back to the farm. By the time our students become re ready to tell the story, they're off to the next thing. and. Um, that that connection of, of communicating the work to the to other interested parties in an effective way is really challenging. And so th that's all just about interpersonal communication and having the time and space to do it. And um, I think that answers the question as well as brings up some stuff I wanted to share that I noticed when listening to everybody else on this panel. Thank you, Dr. Katie. How about other panelists? Anybody else want to take a stab at Benjamin's question? I see Kanchan moving. <laughs> Is what, so, so the question was, what would we as educators like to see? Uh, what do you more? feel is lacking the most in your efforts? And what are your most desired outcomes of your project, of your program? Yes. OK, so hi, Ben. <laughs> um, so What's lacking, what I feel is lacking, obviously most days I feel like young, strong, um, tech savvy people to like do all the this so that I can just do all the things that I can do. <laughs> like I'm, I'm getting uh, admin weary. Uh, I've, I've been the graphic designer and outreach coordinator uh, both on the ground and also online, uh, building our social media presence and things like that for so long now. And I'm, I'm kind of over it. I just want to sit quietly and smell the flowers like Ferdinand. So I'm just thinking about all those wonderful, tech savvy, smart social media, um, fancy young folks that want to come over and just be like, yo, I'll take Instagram and I'll take Facebook and I'll take the email uh, program and and just like just keep sending stuff out and then um, and then I can just organize some beautiful educational work you know without having because a lot, lot of times what happens for me personally is I end up you know cutting cutting corners where it comes to the tech stuff and then the class corners get cut as well so yeah, we have a lot of great volunteers right now, but, and it doesn't even have to be young people. It could be elders, it could be middle-aged folks that just know how to run that stuff and just say, oh, I'll take that off your hands and come on in and do that. And then, uh, and then I can really, we can really focus in on our educational process and our um, implementation of those things that we really wanna just be serving the community with. And that's not the only thing, you know, but I do feel like, it's a lot with outreach we're trying to reach as many people as we possibly can on a daily basis and when you've got a million seeds to plant on a regular and you've got a million starts to transplant and you've got um, you know so many tools to sharpen and clean and organize so that when the volunteers come you've got um, everything ready it just helps just helps to have more hands on deck um, so and then um, what was the other question? <laughs> Sorry. It was about. Uh, it's about the outcomes. Outcomes. 
in spite of not having a full complement of those wonderful, um, um, you know, activities that we need support with, we are still reaching so many people. And I am so grateful for the volunteers that do show up and their commitment and compassion and, and just excitement and enthusiasm for the work that we do at Spiral Gardens. And it's just, and just seeing their hearts and minds change into a true earth steward, you know, it feels amazing. So oftentimes, you know, we may not feel like we have all of the resources at our disposal, um, but people just keep coming anyway and we get to keep teaching and we, we find our ways through this and then it's just love basically going forward it's I'm so grateful um so yeah more of that more of that and feeding more people uh, as much as possible that's really not been our strong suit I mean we give a lot of food away but it's mostly to our neighbors at the senior center next door Kelly you know what I'm talking <laughs> and you know we do our best but we're not we're, we're more focused on getting people engaged in the soil and in the plants yeah thank you Kanshan uh for other panelists that consider themselves educators Moe Annika um what are your thoughts on this um I can start just speaking to the second part of that question, sort of our desires and what we're trying to do um, in that, I think we see sort of agricultural education as more, as less about like agricultural education, but more about like how education can be, or how agriculture can be sort of centered in all different disciplines of education. Um, and specifically how education is really just supporting our life affirming practices um, such that like, yes, we really want our students to know like what type of cover blend crops gonna heal their soil most during that winter season. But we also really want to facilitate that opportunity for them to learn about their culturally relevant foods and be able to grow them and reconnect with their ancestors through that or through lost cultural identities and, and heal those traumas often sort of bound in our relationship with the land. Um, and then thinking about that as our desired outcome, knowing that we're working not you know on the fringes but still connected to this land grant institution that's perpetuated a lot of harms um there's sort of an inherent kind of ongoing um just accountability that we have to do to check in with ourselves in terms of um kind of what that first question was of just like I'm so far lost in the chat now but um something that like we're constantly having to check in with ourselves um to make the most of our efforts um and Moe, I'd welcome you to add anything. I think something that we struggle with a lot is like in that, um, making sure that what we're doing is accessible to as many people as possible. And in university, that means making sure we're able to pay people um, because it's it's a privilege to be out on this land these days. And if it's people have bills to pay and in order to actually like build in time into our lives to, to be on the land, to connect with that healing work, um, oftentimes we have to um, be compensating people for that labor. Yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. Thank you for sharing that so beautifully, Annika. I think just really wanting to hone in on that piece about compensating our labor. I think as much as we are excited about our open hours and being able to host like public open hours five times a week and have anyone come through um, and really setting up an infrastructure to like make sure people are being safe COVID wise, but also just trying to increase our outreach. And we're lucky to have folks and have it be a community led effort in order to increase the social aspects and the cold social aspects of our accessibility. But in terms of ADA accessibility, that's something that we're lacking in. Also in terms of just inherently believing and recognizing that um, gardening as, as a hobby is different, is a different reason to come into our spaces than people who are wanting to gain a, a paid agricultural experience. They want to reconnect to the land. They want to reclaim their history with an environment, to, with a relationship to the environment. There are different reasons that people come into our gardens and farms and recognizing that that access to enter in itself comes with different amount of privileges. And I think one thing that we really struggle with and want to do better at is 
compensating student labor to be there. Um, accessibility also in a physical sense of ADA. Um, and then one long dream within BSF, within Berkeley Student Farms is to also start a CSA program so that we aren't just reliant on student funded grants as we currently are and continuously applying to those every, every semester, but instead of having a little bit more sovereignty from the university. Um, and so wanting to, it's a, definitely a delicate balance between that in terms of how do we, how do we reconcile with our, our background and our foundation as a part of the university, but also wanting to reclaim the forms of oppression that come to our students through the university. Thank you both so much, Annika and Moe. Um, so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna talk as Kelly really quick and and say that you know this situation with the pandemic and having to meet and have panels online is absolutely not my jam. I don't like it. It's not fun. Um, and I think that something is lost, you know, like it's, we are supposed to, according to the agreed upon agenda, Moe, we, <laughs> we, we are supposed to be having a dialogue, but because we're all in our own spaces and we're on this thing, it's really hard um, to have a, a conversation. And so what I would like to do in the last 30-ish minutes of, of this panel is really get us talking to each other around some of these things. One of the, our Acton on Verba is 10 years old this year. And um, I've been seriously contemplating doing a, a podcast or some kind of um, expose on nonprofit um, food justice, social justice, horror stories, and things that I've seen, things that I've heard, places I've been where I'm like, oh God, no, you know? <laughs> and I, 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 I really love that um, talking about social justice and food sovereignty is a, is a big part of this conversation. And I, and I wanna uplift the young folks that are on here that are really hammering that home and just letting you know, the term white supremacy and oppression roll off the tongue. I want to know um, what are some of the challenges that you run into being who you are in the communities that you're working in? And, um, and you know, funding is always a thing. So audience, if you have a few dollars, make sure to donate to any and all of the organizations here. But outside of just funding and the, and the, structural bullshit that goes along with trying to find funding for our for our work. What other challenges do you come across? This is for all the panelists. I um, can speak to that, I think, a little bit. I mean, I've, I've had a, <clears throat> a fair amount of unlearning in the past five years from all my years of academic training, and um, I'm trying to become uh, more rooted in my own culture and also, um, you know, learn to be um, humble and, and listen and, and, and create learning communities where uh, everyone is able to share their experiences and, and show up fully. Uh, and as somebody who's with a, a European ancestry, I think that's especially important. Um, that being said, I mean, I think every student in my class often comes from, you know, incredible background where they have as much to offer as anybody else. And um, so in terms of my approaches to teaching, I've been working hard to um, open up spaces for dialogue in the classroom and, and also move away from traditional uh, assignments that would normally happen in the college level um, classroom. And I think that's been, it's been helpful, I think, to, to cultivate creativity and uh, flexible thinking in, in, uh, in, 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 a, in the way that assignments are, are provided, you know, and like um, uh, knowledge is created. So um, also, I just wanted to put a shout out there for the community colleges that we often bring in um, practitioners as educators. It's a little bit of a unique situation in that people who are actually doing the work can come and teach, whether it be one class, you know, ever so often or in a more consistent way. 
And I think that really brings a whole other perspective on urban agroecology education, particularly for the full diversity of opportunities that there are from the commercial producers all the way to the, um, to the nonprofits and food justice work that needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. What about you, Dr. Katie? You That's like a great- it's, You're it's on the question. verge of saying something. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking. I mean, what Paul said makes sense. And your question is just perfect, Kelly. It's, um, you know, we're all within these systems um, that, um, and no, one's, no one can escape them, right? And so my, my world of, of this is, you know, within the classroom in our California community college system. And, you know, my tactic through my career so far has been to understand the system and kind of try to not try to use it for my own intentions <laughs> and on, on behalf of many who can't always understand how to work the system. And so I've become very aware of how many resources are contained in these special boxes. So I'm, I'm actually well, well resourced because I get to call myself biotechnology, right? There are just dollars flowing from the state to support the work that could count as that. But it doesn't, and, and so navigating where the resources are um, and, and you know, playing nice in those spaces, well, because I just, I don't believe, I mean, I wish it would happen, but these, these systems built on, um, you know, that we've built up for so long, I don't think are gonna disappear within my career. I'm, I'm working to change them. I'm in different, I'm in an academic Senate leadership at my college, totally away from this work, in, you know, from biology and everything entirely. But I want to make sure that the students who are coming through my classroom right now can use the resources that are there while we change the system so that resources can be you know, out there for programs like Moe's or Annika's and Kanchan's so that there isn't that scrounging. But while, while we're here, how, how do I leverage the, that space? And it's, it's hard because we're all sort of trained to be in this hierarchical system with single leaders. And so even people who don't really want to do that gravitate towards someone in a leadership role and, and breaking free of that um and really stepping aside to give the space well to for people to realize they um are just as good to to move work forward as people who have already assumed leadership it, it takes a lot of patience with myself to just be like it's okay you know a way to go forward but wait um, and that's a personal development that I've had to go through to, um, to bring student leadership to this project. Um, I've had to really check myself and my training to, uh, to allow the, you know, a different way of moving forward through the work to, to evolve. And so it's been a, it's, it's a, but at the same time, if I just totally step aside, the money's going to stop because I know how to work that. <laughs> and so it's kind of. You know, it's, it's finding that balance as we move through this time of transition. It's really exciting, um, but it's very uncomfortable um, a lot of the time. So um, I think that's all I can really say on that one. But thank you for that question, Kelly. It's, it's, a, it's an important point. For sure. Who's up? Who's up next? I have a thought. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one challenge that we face, well, also in that this is like the first time that Annika and I and our friend Cole and others are facilitating this class. Um, and so this is all very new to us. Um, but one thing that we find is that it's, we're not really modeling any other UC Berkeley class or I'm not taking a class. It's not like I was in a student and then I'm mimicking that. So I think in terms of us as individuals, it's been really, challenging, but also exactly what we signed up for in terms of learning how to facilitate um, this course and having it be what we were hoping a lot of other classes at UC Berkeley to be like. And just to clarify what I mean by that, there are three things we really value and looked for in this class. And that one, that it's intercultural, the second, that it's place-based and that we we host workshops and we, we, we ground ourselves on the Ohlone land that we are and as farmers. And third, that we really really try to uplift the processes of democratic co-learning 
Um, so this looks like having, we don't speak for majority of the class. We have other students present readings and present topics and share their own experiences. We have a lot of discussion questions. Uh, we also have students add to our syllabus, add readings that they think are relevant and important when we're talking about a certain subject. Um, and I think this, this non-hierarchical or, or efforts to have a non-hierarchical mode of learning um, is also intersectional with, with the efforts of anti-oppression when it comes to anti-oppression within academia in that a lot of the hierarchical education that we, what, that we are a part of in our other UC Berkeley classes are pulling on continuous patterns of learning from white academics or white researchers and papers and thinking that that one way, one-sided one way of learning from a professor and that power dynamic and that one-way direct, one-sided one direction of knowledge um, without a lot of discussions, a lot of like class discussions that also, as you said, Kelly, like have been eliminated from our classes because of Zoom and because of online learning. And so it is a challenge to kind of contradict that and, and start a class during a pandemic that aims to do exactly the opposite of wanting to like just stay in that easier one-sided professor to student interaction and instead wanting to learn from campesino a campesino, landless peasant farmer movements and the way that they share information and knowledge and really wanting to pull on the co-learning co -learning environment, which also requires centering and fostering a safe and inclusive environment, right? For, in order for students to be able to feel safe and share their knowledge and their experiences with the food system. Um, and so that looks like community guidelines, that looks like having a heart and labor and land acknowledgement before every class. And so I think learning all these different methods of how do we feel safe? How do we, we feel cared for in a, in a community? How can we learn from each other? These are all questions that we're all figuring out together and something that we don't have a model from the university or from past classes, which is the challenge part. But I think in terms, of, that's exactly what the gap that we're looking to fill, that's exactly the change we're trying to make. And we want to be in these spaces, we want to be learning from each other. And so that's been, I think the main part when it comes to how our education is a little bit more transformative. Um, Annika, if there's anything else you wanted to add. I think you said it perfectly. Thank you, thank you both. Kanshan, where are you at? Hi, I was I was moving from outside to inside. I was getting cold. <laughs> Got it. Hmm. Every, everyone's so beautifully articulate and clear. It's so it's so lovely to hear the young ones speaking from their powerful and revolutionary voices. I really appreciate everything y'all have to say. And Dr. Katie also, you know, just like doing your examination, self-examination is so important. And Paul, you know, I see you, I hear you and thank you and tell your friends, keep, keep it up. <laughs> so important. And uh, I don't remember what the question was, but I will say this, that um, just, uh, just the thing that I've been contemplating the most, and I, I talked about this on the panel, or on the um, discussion last night with Paul's class, his uh, students, and uh, we we were discussing, you know, how how to move through all of how we are here on this planet, and how to make moves, how to do good works, how to connect with each other, and you know, I just. I just want to say this is probably totally not the answer to the question that you asked, Kate, Kelly, but, but I will just say that, you know, start with the source of all uh, of who we are and all that we have, you know, start with the source, you know, and who's the source? Well, the earth, she gives us everything, you know, our ability to study soil, our ability to uh, connect with plants and animals, you know, birds and all of living things and, and ourselves even, you know, and she's the great equalizer. And so not COVID, COVID is not the great equalizer, but it is a kind of equalizer. But I just wanna say, you know, start with your connection to the planet, find out what she has for you, 
you know, to, what is she trying to direct you to do? You know, you can really listen to her. She's like a giant engine, like bigger than a ship's engine, bigger than a, any engine. <laughs> so she's like the great mother, you know, and she has instructions for us. And it sounds like a lot of us are really listening closely. And those instructions are going to take the shapes they take differently for each of us. But as long as I, I feel like as long as she's the starting point for our actions, our movements, and you know, how we move in the world, like we can watch her, listen to her and watch all of her cycles, um, the different seasons and planetary movements. And it's, it's not only is it fun and nourishing, but it's really important information she has for us. So that might sound nebulous to some, but uh, honestly, literally go like lay on the ground, you know, absorb her wonderful vibration into your body. And I swear for a goddess that you will get some news. <laughs> and then you can use that information to inform the way you move in the world. Every step you take, the people you talk to, how, how to interact with them, you know? But yeah, that's been like my new mantra, like listen to her, you know, start with her and then see what she's, she thinks we should do because we aren't doing anything without her. I mean, I don't really know what else to say about that, but yeah, I don't know what she's been to say to people lately. <laughs> so. Thank you, Kanchan. Um, okay. Thank you all for indulging me in that question. I feel like um, if I were to answer the question about challenges, I would need like a glass of, uh, is that a glass or a bottle? Glass or a bottle of gin to get started. Like it would be a whole thing. So outside of that, let me get back to the list of questions from our audience. Um, Elaine Simon asks, can the panelists talk about strategies for helping students to get into agroecological agro work post-graduation, or more generally to continue to be part of these wonderful communities when they are finished with their studies. Who wants to start us off? I'm happy to do it. It's, I'm pretty involved in that sort of thing. Um, this is a great question, Elaine. Uh, thank you. I think, uh, connecting what people are learning when, especially when they enter intentionally into an, uh, an educational program, like what we offer at the community colleges and then where that leads them is, is of critical importance. And I think a lot of uh, students may be interested in uh, urban agroecology, but may not be clear on what they can do with it afterwards. So I think that's very important um, to make those connections more evident. Uh, I think, that while we're doing a few, we have a few strategies that um, I, I'm pretty sure will be pretty effective uh, for making that pathway more clear. We um, are fundraising like crazy. And I, I saw there was another comment by Nicole Feldman. Thank you for your comments around how it seems easier for some people to uh, fundraise than others. I acknowledge that. Um, my educational background and my ability to speak the language that foundations and uh, age, age, uh, you know, USDA and everybody else knows uh, does help me fundraise. And it's a skill that I've learned over many years. So what I'm trying to do to the best of my ability is to channel those resources into paid internships where students learn. We have a program called COPED, Cooperative Education that allows students to uh, do either paid or unpaid uh, internships <clears throat> and earn credit for it. So that's one very important aspect. And since a lot of urban agriculture projects are relatively small, they may not be in a position to uh, fund students for their time. And so I've, done a, I've put, I put in a fair amount of effort this past year in uh, building up that program. And uh, thankfully, the, 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 the grants that we wrote, uh, two of them were successful. So that's, that's one strategy. Um, let's see, what else? I think um, 
Well, in in the community college, there we get this huge spectrum of students. We've got people who are high school students. We've got people who are looking to transfer to four year colleges and universities. We've got people who are um, career changing, you know, like who may have been doing one thing and now they want to do something else. And then we've got people who are just curious to learn, right? Who, who are just want to expand their knowledge base. And so um, we take a very individualized approach to guiding uh, students. And so like I have a list of uh, students that I, I keep tabs on and I, and I check in with on a regular basis. And I think that one-on-one -on -one contact is very helpful. Also recognizing that all of the instructors have a lot of networks within the urban agriculture community and we can help make the connections for people depending on their particular um, interests. So those are just two of the ways we're, we're going about that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, any other answers to this question? Because we have at least three other questions to go to. Okay, wonderful. Short and sweet, just come go volunteer in one of your local projects, your local outdoor gardening projects, your nurseries, your community farms, just go volunteer and do that. <laughs> That's a great point. I mean, being a community-based organization, we absolutely hire from our pool of volunteers, you know, to Moe and Annika's point, you know, the idea of paying people for their time and labor and everything is so important but we can't know we can't know that you're available until you come to us right kanshan that's what we're trying to say right <laughs> like, come volunteer and if you're dope 9 times out of 10 we will hire you and i won't speak for kanshan we Go just ahead. hire our volunteers exactly exactly we often hire our volunteers and um, I know that you all, Spiral Gardens, is as committed as acting on Verba to paying a living wage, you know, so yeah, yeah, or more, exactly. So making sure that y'all get out there and volunteer so that we know that you're into what we're doing. Um, okay, how about Mishwa Lee asks, are any of you working on or aware of inclusion in Green New Deal efforts to include training with funding for agroecology, also funding for youth to get involved? I'll, I'll start a little bit on that one. Thank you, Dr. Um, I'm not aware of particular Green New Deal funding, but I think this, this kind of question speaks to that expertise that Paul and I mentioned that we can work the system. And I think Green New Deal money is gonna come for this type of work is going to probably be put within our current system. So the US Department of Agriculture will have particular um, grant programs to, to do this kind of work, right? Um, maybe the Department of Energy will have grant programs to do this kind of work. And um, there, I'm sure there are other agencies I'm forgetting about, but um, that's the trick. The public money is in these public systems and it's there's a lot of it and it, it's discouraging sometimes to think about the small amount comparatively that we can get from our local donations and people's backbreaking efforts and blood, sweat, and tears that real people are giving. As taxpayers, we're all giving so much to this giant coffer and um, finding ways to crack that open to do the, the work that's that we think is valuable is tricky. And so um, I don't think there's going to be in the Green New Deal legislation, the word agroecology, but that money probably can be used to do this work if someone knows how to open the spigot by writing the, the right grant. That would be, and I think that's a great question, trying to look to that. Yeah, I, I think so too. And, you know, I think that it's probably, Another symptom of how sick this country is, is to your point, Dr. Katie, we put so much money, you know, so much money and blood, sweat and tears into this country. We, we pay our taxes, you know, all up and down the scale, you know what I mean? And then when organizations like mine, and again, I won't speak for Spiral Gardens, but, you know, organizations like ours that are smaller, those 
those grants are like inaccessible, you know, like they they set the the bar so high, not for the work, right? Like what the work is is in the communities, but it gets only folks that have a development director with a, you know experience writing government grants can ac access those dollars. So what I'm hoping for is if and when the Green New Deal money money does come down, that you know we have folks like AOC and Stacey Abrams that recognize that you know we're doing the work. We don't have time to sit there and rejigger a theory of change for you know, for 25k. You know what I mean? Did you have more, Dr. Katie? I'm just going to say yeah. they aren't. In, it's important to. I mean those folks it's actually biden and the executive branch that is going to shift the mechanism for funding right the the legislators are in charge of legislation and and letting the money go somewhere but it's really who's in charge of the usda's mechanisms well that's the executive branch that's biden and the people he appoints are going to influence the way that grants or other or just direct funding right are are given so i just it's, Absolutely. it's important I, I to was, know that. <laughs> yeah, no, I guess what my point was, was trying to figure out how, you know, AOC and the rest of the squad can advocate for organizations to be able to have better access, right? Um, another um, uh, nonprofit slash food justice horror story is getting phone calls from better resourced organizations saying, hey, did you get this money? No, we didn't. How did you get it? Oh, development director wrote the grant. Fabulous. You know, I'll just be out here with my can, you know, asking for folks to. Anyway, sorry. Thanks for laughing, Annika. Anyway, <laughs> does anybody else want to answer Mishwa Lee's uh, question around uh, funding for agroecology and funding for youth? Since we are the Youth Urban Farm Project, I can say that um, we're noticing a lot more grants being offered to get kids outside, especially after uh, the pandemic. So um, if you are running a nonprofit and uh, work with youth, please look into those kind of funds, like having kids go camping and hiking and just be outdoors seems to be the, the trend more than food at the moment. Um, and just a plug for Acton on Verba, our three farms are run by youth age five to 15. The kids plan, plant, harvest, and sell the produce that we grow in a non-COVID year. And 100% of those dollars of that profit goes into individual savings accounts that can only be used for educational purposes. So, you know, spread the word to your friends with kids. Anyways, <laughs> um, let's see. Little Dove Broad Forks and Friends asks, the push seems to be more food production going into nonprofit. Is there a hope or strategy for developing for-profit models that operate independently and successfully? Anyone? Well, I can say as, <laughs> as a person that runs a nonprofit and a 300 plus person CSA, um, I think that one thing, I mean, I just, I, I always feel like Debbie Downer when I say this, you know, especially to university people and, and students and whatnot, but like folks gotta really understand that there is no, there's no real money in farming unless you're farming at a huge rate or you have a, a niche, right? Like unless you know that somebody is so enamored of your mission or how you farm or what your greens taste like or whatever it is that they cannot get enough of it. I think about um, Rapunzel and how that whole situation ended up, right? Like the pregnant mom wanted the greens from the witch's garden. Like you have to have the witch's garden in order to try to make money off of farming. And, you know, the rest of the farmers are being subsidized and, you know, don't pay people well and, and all of that stuff. So the whole food system is janky AF. The, the, what we need to keep in mind is making sure that 
if we're gonna use a for-profit model, because essentially that's what the CSA is, right? The, right, you're, I mean, financed by the USDA as Michelle is noting, you know, like that's a form of, subsi of subsidizing, right? Like people, the government pays you to farm or not farm, you know? But in the, in the matter of our CSA, it is a for-profit model whose story, to you, Dr. Katie, whose story is so compelling that people will sign up to have their food delivered, right? Otherwise, they could go to, you know, the Berkeley Food Institute and, and pick up some stuff. They could go to Spiral Gardens and grab a couple eggplants or whatever, right? But because, but because the story is so compelling about the kids getting the dollars and so on and so forth, people will pay into that. Regular farmers, the reason we're able to serve 300 plus folks is because we uh, partnered with uh, farmers of color and women farmers who have not who have not been able to get their story told the way that we have, right? So we're able to pay them a premium for the produce that they grow and it all becomes enveloped in our story. That's our model. Um, I don't know if you talk to some startup people, some venture capitalists, I'm sure there's a whole other thing to that. But for us, you know, it all begins, it all begins and ends with a really compelling story. Other thoughts on that or should we keep going? Uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, uh, thanks, I'm right, go for it, please. Oh, sorry, Paul. <laughs> I've been, I don't know how to work Zoom, y'all. Sorry, I'm just like <laughs> pushing all over the places. But yes, what you said, absolutely, yes, a compelling story. And you're one of the best storytellers that I know. And they, magical organization, bear so much beautiful fruit. And it's like, I just constantly be singing your praises. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all of compelling story is helpful. You know, and also community, yeah, like you said, community buy-in, you know, people are so just, just seeing the love that goes into the work that you're doing, you know, people are seeing the, the beauty in the way that you are holding space for community. And it, it, that is, you are the compelling story, Kelly, <laughs> you're the one. And it's like, everything spirals out from you, you know, because of you holding the w space the way that you do for those children, you know, for those families and for that land, you know, in that part of Oakland that most people would call no man's land. It's like Kelly's land. <laughs> it's like so good and so, um, so nourishing. So yes, definitely be, maybe just be the story, you know, being the story and then teaching others how to be that story and that voice. And when I think about <clears throat> all of the different ways the food system has not only impacted the earth, but also the people that do the growing of the food, the people that receive the food by shopping for it in supermarkets and, and other outlets, um, the ways that it's impacted our health, our air, you know, our soil. It's just really, I think it's really amazing to have all of y'all here together, all of us together like this. So what I was saying yesterday too on our panel or on our um, discussion was uh, just really like thinking about ways to really build in our food systems, bringing them close to home. There's no reason with all of this amazing land available, you know, whether it's, you know, arable or not, we can always build raised beds or whatever, but you know, localizing our food system, you know, getting rid of uh, big ag, you know, going to that local community run led agroecological, you know, process that wouldn't be very difficult to do. You know, and I see Atenon Verba's doing that there, you know, there's a very thriving garden and farm out there that's feeding a lot of people. And then also, like you said, you know, interacting with black and brown farmers and women run farmer farms that you know help to feed the community that you serve urban tilth is kicking ass big time like they are going bananas out there in richmond the north richmond farm is providing so much food 
and, you know, access, you know, and it, it serves quite a lot of people as well, you know, and this is how we can actually figure, this is how we can actually have a much more sustainable food system is by actually localizing it. And I, I, I like to think about four square blocks and in the middle of those four square blocks, there's a farm that feeds those four square blocks of families, you know, corner stores should be corner gardens, you know, people should be thinking about how to build those, you know, instead of like, continuing to allow municipalities to have, you know, these unhealthy food sources or non-food sources, as it were, sources of addictive substances. And just, it's just really incredible. Like it could be so simple. We have Cuba as a model, you know, there's just no reason why we, are, we shouldn't be doing what, what they're doing. We are supposedly the most developed nation on the planet, nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> And I, would, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going, yeah, exactly. And <laughs> what is that? The profit part, the profit is community health. The profit is community wealth. The profit is community education, access and, you know, and, and, and um, access and. Um, and that's the difference. In, in your, in your, in the production of your food and where it comes from and your kids just grow up that way. So I know it's utopian, but not it's not that far off, right? But that's the difference. And it's not that far off. You said folks in your community are welcome to whatever the farm produces, right? Same with our farm, right? Yes. Like that's the thing, but, but people, I mean, it's again, the situation where people are only used to working one way, like Moe was saying about, about school, right? the instruction comes from the instructor, not from the students, you know, back, right? We're not supposed to improve the instructor. The instructor is supposed to imprint knowledge on us. We're just supposed to be happy about it, you know? We're not supposed to be giving away food. We're supposed to be selling that food at whatever the highest price is. And here's the thing though, something to think about as we're wrapping this up, don't forget, um, I see Merit has put the um, the survey in. Please, everybody, do the five minute survey. But before we wrap it all up, I just want to say, damn it, I forgot what I was going to say. So, y'all have a wonderful day. Thank you all so much for joining us, Kanshan, Doctor Doctor Katie, Paul, Annika, Moe. Am I missing anybody? Of course, Kanshan. I've said Kanshan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> me everybody that's been on that's on the panel thank you so much for all of your hard work and what you do in the world you're wonderful and thank hello. you everybody hi. hello hello hi oh um i have a 20 acre farm and i've been trying to get in the chat i i can't get in um and i'm looking for uh community people that want to farm it i'm a minority african-american woman and I've had it for seven years. Okay. Um, do you have an ink pen? Yes, and I have an email. Uh, can I give you my email? If you give me your email, it's all over. Like whoever's on this call will get it. That's okay, right? Okay, let's do it. <laughs> okay, it's F A Y E T H Gardens, plural at gmail.com. It's faithgardens at gmail.com. Got it. F-A-Y-E-T-H gardens at gmail.com. Yes, and it's private. I don't have a website. I don't get grants. It's private. And uh, I just uh, bought it to try to provide food for the community. I was an educator for many years in Oakland public schools, uh, Laney College, San Francisco City College. I got fed up with the grant system, so I went private. Fabulous. Thank you. I'm almost there myself, holding oh. it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. All right. Yeah, everybody take care. Paul, do we need to stay on so that you can congratulate us on a dope panel? Or <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. Why don't we stay on just for a minute? That'd be fun. Let's do that. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Yay.
Hi, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs>